The Holy Gospel according to Mark. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, and make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And the people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. Imagine that There's a new preacher in town, and he wants to buy an empty school building down the street to start a new congregation. And he does just that. And soon the parking lot of the new church is filled to overflowing. So, so curious, you decide to drop in just to see kind of what's going on. Well, the first thing you notice is that you go in there, and there's absolutely no place to sit. The only, there, oh, every, oh, only thing is, everybody is standing. And they're all standing in a long line. It's so crowded, you can hardly see where the, where the line ends. But what you do see, is you see somebody dressed in something that kind of looks like a shag carpet with a belt. And he's yelling at people. He's going, singer, singer, repent. Turn from your wicked ways. He's got to have a kind of a southern accent with it. And he stops long enough to pop a couple of grasshoppers in his mouth. And while he's munching them down and trying not to get the legs between his teeth, he turns to the people in line. He takes them and he throws them into a big swimming pool. And just before the person goes under, you see the person going under as a member of celebration. And he says, I baptize you now. But there will be another who will baptize you again. What? What? Who does this guy think he is anyway? I mean, what kind of an impression would this new preacher have on you if you saw that? Well, my guess is you would react to this new preacher in exactly the same way as the Jews, Jewish authorities, would have to the colorful character we see in today's gospel. This man by the name of John the Baptizer, or John the Baptist. Now, every year we hear about John the Baptist. And maybe it's, maybe it's because we hear so much about this guy that we become a bit numb to the shockwave he would have caused. His dress, his diet, his demands, all of that were outrageous. And he believed in telling, telling it to you just like he saw it. Didn't matter who you were, he, could tell you, he would tell you that your sin smells and you needed a bath. Now John, of course, lived in the wilderness. It was basically a limestone desert, shimmering in the haze of the heat, moving out, overlooking the Dead Sea, and then descending in dreadful and unscalable prefaces, precipices, down to the shore. Now, what's amazing about this whole thing is that people went out to the desert to see John. People had to go out of their way to see him speak. Now, again, as I said, John wore a rather peculiar outfit of camel's hair and a leather belt, kind of the same kind of outfit that the prophet Elijah wore. So it would have, would have been obvious to the Jewish people that this man was portraying himself as a prophet. Now, 
in just about any larger city, you always seem to have some kind of street corner evangelist out there. I know in Columbus, I saw them all the time when, when I worked downtown there. They were always planting themselves in your way, daring you to ignore them, using the Bible as a blunt weapon so that you have to cross the streets in order to avoid them. But John didn't do that. He planted himself in the middle of the wilderness so that anyone who wanted to hear what he had to say had to go out of their way to go hear him. So the question is, why on earth would somebody brave this lonely desert wilderness when the temple was right close by in Jerusalem? You know, that place with all the rabbis and all their accumulated wisdom and all the extra services they, they uh, offered. Obviously, anyone who would turn away from all that was looking for something else. They were looking for something that that holy temple couldn't supply. I try to imagine what John looked like. Big and hairy, you know, getting his camel hair soaked in the Jordan River and then dried out by the blistering wilderness sun. I would bet standing next to him and inhaling would have been an adventure in and of itself. But, 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 but if you think what John looked like and what John smelled like was outrageous, what he was doing was an outright scandal. I mean, it would have been scandalous to tell somebody who considered themselves to be the chosen people of God that they needed to repent. They already believed that they were under the the umbrella of God's grace, so why on earth would they need to make any changes at all? And besides, baptisms were meant for the proselytes, you know, those who converted to the Jewish faith. So the Jews knew baptism, But the amazing thing about John's baptism was that he, a Jew, was asking other Jews to submit to that which only Gentiles were supposed to need. You see, see, what happened was John had made a tremendous discovery that to be a Jew in the radical sense was not to be a member of God's chosen people. No, it was not the Jewish life. It was the cleansed life that belonged to God. So John preached a baptism of repentance. Now the word, the Greek word for that means to turn. And repentance, you see, is a turning away from evil and turning towards God. In other words, repentance doesn't just mean saying, well, gee, I'm really, really sorry and then going out and doing the same thing over and over again? Repentance means turning your life around. Turning your life around in order to avoid doing the same thing again and again and again. It's like how once a couple of kids, they thought they, thought they would play a big joke on a, an old curmudgeon of a farmer by kidnapping one of his cows. And they got caught. And they told the owner of the cow they were sorry, but he, he said, he responded by saying, okay, you're not sorry for what you did. You're only sorry because you got caught. Well, repenting of our sins means that we know that we have already been caught and that we need to make a concerted effort to change our ways. The problem is to do so is beyond our capabilities. That we need, we need to depend on someone else. Because no matter how hard we try, we are never quite good enough. There was one critic one time who went to a lot of churches and heard many a preacher say, don't try to impress God with your works. Don't try to keep the rules and regulations and thus try to win your way, therefore, to heaven. And this critic said, when he looked around, he said, at these utterly casual Christians, he said to someone, well, I look around, and I got to say, who the heck is trying? Studies have shown 
that those Christians who participate in Bible studies and in Sunday school classes, for the most part, they really just use the Bible to reinforce the way that they're already living. They don't see the Bible as challenging them to change the way they live. I once heard about a guy who called up the highway department to complain about the condition of the road in front of his house. He kept calling and kept calling, complaining about all the potholes and the bumps, but the highway department just never did a darn thing. Finally, though, the guy kept calling so many times, the highway department said that they're, they are going to do something about this road after all. So instead of coming out and repaving it, the highway department instead put up a sign that said, Rough Road Ahead. I wonder if that's not the way that the thing that we do, a lot of us do with our lives. We see the sins that are there, but instead of fixing them, we kind of ignore them. So once again, on this Advent Sunday, we hear John the Baptist calling out to all of us, repent, prepare the way of the Lord. Okay, so what do we do to prepare the way of the Lord? Is that road already in the condition that it should be? Does it need a little patching here and there? Or does that road really need to be torn up and totally rebent, rebuilt down to the foundation? 2,000 plus years ago, the Savior God promised to send us was born in a manger in Bethlehem. And this baby named Jesus, he lived for us. He died for us. And he rose again on Easter Sunday morning for us. And now whenever we work to live more faithfully, to live more faithfully to God's will, we are continually reminded that Jesus is coming back for us, coming back to gather us into his loving arms, to carry us to his home with our Father in heaven. Yes, yes, Jesus has promised that he will return. My family in the faith don't let your preparations to receive him end with Advent. But throughout the entire year, examine your lives and work to make changes where God shows that you, you, that you are necessary. And through these acts of preparation and repentance, find comfort. Find comfort and be assured that God will be faithful to each and every one of you throughout all of eternity. Amen.